that dolphin sound that we hear on SpongeBob SquarePants, like when SpongeBob is cursing, they play a, a dolphin sound to cover up like the curse mm-hmm. words. That sound is not actually a dolphin. Oh no. Most likely to be a director. Most likely to be an engineer. Most likely to be a journalist. A doctor. An astronaut. A best-selling author. Welcome to Most Likely To, a podcast presented by Donors Choose. We talk to some of the world's greatest minds to find out how they became who they are today. If you can see it, you can be it. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Raven, or who many of you may know as Dr. Raven the Science Maven. She's a renowned molecular biologist and a woman who continues to crush boundaries placed on people in the STEM field. Raven's science-themed rap videos and relatable content have gone viral many times as a way to teach science online and via social media. Raven has been recognized in Forbes 30 Under 30, Fortune 40 Under 40, and Ebony Power 100. On today's episode, Raven will share how she overcame obstacles as a woman of color in the corporate science world, the secret to going viral, and her new podcast, The Science of Life. She is kind and brilliant. On Most Likely To, it's Raven Baxter. This episode of Most Likely To is sponsored by KPMG. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a meteorologist. And I was just so inspired by how excited my local news reporters were about reporting on the weather. And I said, well, once I realized that it was actually science, I said, oh, well, you can be that excited and talk about science. Well, I want to be a scientist. And so that love for learning about the atmosphere and learning about weather turned into wanting to know about space and like going beyond the atmosphere. And so I thought about becoming an astronaut and studying like physics and gravity and like all of this stuff. The issue of climate change became um, very prevalent in the media. And I wanted to then become an environmental scientist. And so I would say, I mean, today now I'm a molecular biologist, but I would say that my passions really fueled, like my social passions and the things that I wanted to see in the world really influenced what kind of professional I wanted to be and what kind of science I wanted to pursue. But how amazing that you um, saw meteorology as a career path because that is science communicating communication, right? And you yeah. identified that really early on and you kind of like that that's so consistent with what your passion is now today. So that's amazing. a really good point. I guess I never really thought about it that way, but you're right. Yeah. Huh. Well, I know you grew up right outside of Buffalo, New York, and I'm curious what was high school like for you? High school was very fun. Um, I was a very active student. I was a part of a lot of clubs. I played sports. I was um, a like a star athlete, cheerleader, ran track and field. Um, I was a sprinter and a jumper. I was pretty smart and I was very goofy. I really haven't changed. Oh my gosh, what could you not do back then and now? (laughs) That's amazing. And did you have a teacher or a coach who um, made an impact on your life and what did they say or do to make that impact? There are a couple people who stick out. Um, One of them is Mrs. Kim Preshoff. And she was a high school teacher teacher of mine, and she taught environmental science. Mm. But um, she taught me that it was okay to be this weird, quirky, fun, just eccentric person, because that's what she was. And she'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I loved her for it. And she was just so amazing. She actually went on to do more amazing things. I believe she's retiring very soon and she's a TED fellow. Um, Wow. Yeah. She's a, she's a TED fellow. So, um, you know, clearly she's a great role model. What was your first job ever? And, and kind of looking back on it now, is there anything that you learned about yourself from that first job experience? Well, I did work at Burger King and I don't know if this is going to like distort anyone's perceptions of fast food. But 
I learned that everything is not what it seems. Like you go through the drive through and you know, you ask for something and you get something, but you don't actually, even if you go inside of the restaurant, you don't really get a good look at the food preparation and the process that goes into you getting the thing in the bag. You just give them your money, you take the bag and you leave. And it tastes good. I actually like Burger King. Um, but the process of making the food doesn't look like what you think it is. So like, for example, the burgers. <laughs> um, I think at one point, like they advertise, hey, we sell like frame, flame broiled burgers. But what we were doing was dropping these patties into like a slot. And then there's a conveyor belt that like flames the patties and they would just all plop out into this tray and we'd stuff the tray into this warmer. And so when you get, when someone orders a meal, you know, we take the bun and then we open the tray and we take the patty out and assemble the burger and wrap it up. But you would think that it was a matter of, oh, taking ground beef and like forming the patty and pressing it and cooking it on the grill. Like it's, it's not, it's not that. So I, I learned, I'm like, oh, you know, unless you actually do the work yourself, you don't actually know what goes into a process. You can see that lesson play out in so many different areas. Like even like you as an Instagram creator, what you see is not what is actually happening most of the time, right? And you don't see the, the behind the scenes, like real, what, real life of what's happening. But exactly. that's a much more that's a much more gruesome example of that like conveyor belt of <laughs> flames and <laughs> um, yeah yeah amazing. it's you have an idea of how things work and it, you know you get the same product but the process is just wildly different than what you imagine and yeah, yeah you're totally right it's exactly what it's like being a creator I think a lot of people think that it's easy but you see a product, right? The product could be something as simple as a 60 second video, but you don't realize it took six hours of planning. And although the video was 60 seconds long, there might've been 60 takes that you had to do to get the video. And then editing that down to 60 seconds takes can take six hours. So really you're looking at like maybe even 15 hours that go into a minute long video mm. um, that a lot of people just don't account for. And so with that being said, it's pretty hard being a creator and doing other things. And I, I sometimes marvel at how I'm even able to do it, like get these things accomplished. I, I, I do too. I mean, just looking at <laughs> how all the things, all the ideas and all the, the v different projects that you're working on, it's pretty inspiring. Um, so speaking of your other work, other than being a creator, you're a molecular biologist. What, um, what initially inspired you to go into molecular biology in particular? It's and, and funny can you define because... Can you define what it means to be a molecular biologist for, of for our listeners? Yeah, so molecular biology, well, first, biology is a study of life. Molecular biology is the study of life in the context of molecules. So how molecules generate life, what they do to support life, and how life forms use molecules in their living process. There's so many fields that, that molecular biologists work in, but um, these are all things that you can't see, generally can't see with your eyes. So we use a lot of tools. Um, we do a lot of experiments to measure things that we can't necessarily see. You gave a TED Talk called um, You Don't Look Like a Scientist. So tell me what what does a scientist look like? And how were you made to feel like you didn't belong in the field of science? Yeah, I mean, I always say a scientist looks like you. <laughs> um, ev everyone can be a scientist. And I think, I mean, my, you know, I like to say 
everyone innately is a scientist. Where they may not be a professional scientist, but I think the essence of science is curiosity. Taking away all of the the flowery language around science, it's it's a process for us to answer those questions. We've developed a system called the scientific method that involves questions and hypotheses and um, conducting experiments and gathering data and drawing conclusions. Like that is a that is a system, and so you don't need to be or look a certain way to use that system to answer questions about the world around you. And you also don't need to be or look a certain way to do that for a living, (laughs) which is, which would make you a scientist. Other people don't think that way. They, some people, you know, in our society do not believe that you can look like that anybody can use the scientific method to answer questions about their world, that anybody can be a professional scientist. And they think that you have to look a certain way to do that, which is absurd. Um, and so, yeah, I, I encountered a really unfortunate issue when I started out in my career as a scientist. Um, I actually had a woman who I worked with um, who didn't recognize me because I was new. It was my first day of work, but she encountered me in a mail room um, and threatened to call the police on me because she didn't believe that I was her colleague. Um, she literally said, well, you don't look like you could work here. And meaning I didn't look like I could be a part of a science department. And that really never was lost on me. I, you know, that that sparked a, the genesis of my career as a science, like a public science figure or science communicator, um, because I felt that it was it was necessary for me to take up um, space and representation of myself authentically and really shift the narrative of what does a scientist look like. And also it became important for me to create a space where everyone feels welcome to engage in science because again, I believe that anyone is a scientist and can do science and can become or can become a scientist. So yeah, that's that's my TED talk. Thanks for watching it. <laughs> yeah, I was I was so blown away by your TED talk and just the the idea that you would t- you would have faced such a such adversity and just sort of turn it around and use your gifts and your talent to actually make a change and make a difference for others is is so inspiring. Hi, this is Sunya from Brooklyn, New York. If I'm interested in becoming a molecular biologist, what are one or two easy things that I could do now in high school to explore this career? I would try to do a lot of public speaking. You have to have a few things in order to do public speaking. First, you have to know what you're talking about. <laughs> so that requires you to be a good researcher, um, a scholar. To It, it requires you to um, really be prepared to represent fully represent what you have to say. Um, So there's one. And then two, what public speaking also does for you is develop your confidence. And that is a very important part of being any, any professional, any type of professional, any type of job you have. Confidence in being able to not only like be smart, but represent yourself in the conversations that you're having about the things that you know and doing that with ease and confidence, that will take you so far in life because I can't tell you how many um, adults that I encounter who are in their field, they've been in their field, they could have even been in their field for many years now and are maybe even more senior to me um, and they're asking me about confidence. And so if you start early and um, try to just get yourself out there as much as you possibly can, and it doesn't even have to be in science, like 
let's say you're passionate about horseback riding, or I don't know, find something that you're passionate about and find ways to, um, find ways to get speaking opportunities. That's such good advice and advice I've actually never heard from folks about, you know, uh, from about students. It makes so much sense to learn public speaking and it's such you broke it down so beautifully. I don't need to repeat it. But um, on that note, I think it's so great that you took something that could be perceived as boring to some, like science, and you made it fun and you made it inclusive. Talk to me a little bit about that and how students could do the same thing and take a, a passion in their lives and make it fun and inclusive as well. One of the things that really tickles me about being a science communicator is just how much people don't understand that even the most beginner entry level um, concepts of what I know can be very fascinating to everyone else. So like, I don't know, one quintessential thing that I hear when I tell people I'm a scientist is they're like, oh, well, uh, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, but do you know like how it got there? People think that the mitochondria is like a relic of an old bacteria that basically became trapped inside of what are now our cells. Mitochondria has its own DNA, which is circular, like bacterial DNA. Um, and it's just really fascinating. We think that it had, we got mitochondria through a thing called endosymbiosis. So like the cool thing about that is we all have mitochondria, so it's relevant to all of us. Um, and we all know about bacteria. So like when you, when you find ways to connect all of these little points of people's lives that they might not have thought were connected, um, it becomes really fascinating and it often leads to more questions. And I think just the most important part of this is sharing what you know, but in a way that makes, that is two-sided, like two-way, you know? I share something, hey, what do you think? What do you know about this? And then they share something and maybe it's something that you didn't know, or maybe you have a question to ask. Like I, and that is why Twitter is my biggest platform is because it is a conversational platform. Um, and I specialize in that two way um, mm. interactions. I don't do well on platforms like Instagram or YouTube, like because that's those, those are mostly show and tell platforms, but not conversation. I'd love to hear a few examples of, you know, how did you how did you make something go viral? I am naturally like a community oriented thinker. And so I think that <laughs> um, I really, truly view my following as a community. And I that's why I kind of don't like calling them followers because they're not, they're not following, they're following me, but like, I feel like I'm more so leading a community versus being followed, if that makes any sense. I think that my content naturally just goes viral because I am very attuned to things that my community is looking for. So, so give us I, an example of, of, of yeah. So, I mean, we could even just take the the first time I kind of went super viral was I made a music video and it was in March of 2020 and I was living in New York, in Buffalo, New York at the time. Um, and this was the day of the shutdown when Governor Cuomo said, hey guys, I'm locking you in your house, we're on lockdown basically. But I realized that I had information that a lot of people didn't have. And I wasn't panicked enough to, you know, to join the chaos. I just said, well, what is the best way I can get this information that I know to other people so that they don't panic as much? And I decided to make a music video. So I remixed um, Lil Boozy's 
Wipe Me Down, which is mm-hmm. like a nightclub anthem, mm-hmm. um, to Wipe It Down, which was a COVID-19 prevention and awareness message, like PSA, let's call it. And um, I made a dance <laughs> and- I saw it, it was great. <laughs> I had so much fun. It's very I catchy. It. I made the song in like 20 minutes, made the music video in about an hour, put it all together and put it on my Facebook page privately, like my personal private Facebook page. Mm. And my friends were like, Raven, this is amazing. Like you have to put this, make it public. And I said, absolutely not. Never, (laughs) I will never, this is not leaving our circle. (laughs) And they begged me, they begged me, begged me, begged me. And um, I said, okay, fine. And it went extremely viral. It was on every news station um, news. I have like a, a montage of different news um, staff dancing to the song in the studio. Like it's, it was really cool, but yeah, it was super viral. And that is how I started my platform. Mm-hmm. When you center other people and not yourself, then they they do the same in return. And mm-hmm. that's, I think that's how I've built such a huge following is like, I started the party, but people just keep bringing other people Joining to the, the party. party. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now you're growing the party even further and you're launching a new podcast called The Science of Life. Yeah. Tell us about the podcast and why we should listen to it. When I talk to people that I don't know about science, what I realize is that they're always trying to relate it back to themselves and their life experiences and just things that they already know and things that are happening in society. So, and those are always valid questions, but unfortunately, as I've described science, it's a process of answering questions using a structured method that is just purely fact-based and data-based and we don't have the room in there we don't allow the room in there to um to talk about the societal context of these questions so for example a scientist can you know measure water pollution coming from a factory in an area and have this data set of, okay, wow, this river is really polluted um, because of this factory. But then the social context is, hey, actually this river that's really polluted is where this city is getting their water supply from. And now we have a whole bunch of people in the city who are sick and maybe they don't have access to like good health care. And like, maybe there's a whole bunch of other things going on and maybe they're disproportionately um, like disadvantaged for various socioeconomic reasons. And now we have a social context on top of the science to talk about that really ties together our human experience like in this society. And so on the podcast, we talk about those intersections. Like we've talked about animal behavior and like things that we know that we see in nature, like maybe in in a forest, right? Like animal behavior and then thinking about, huh, don't some don't don't humans do some of this stuff too? Like um and just really thinking abstractly about science and society and just talking about some raw truths of of social science, but the factual data within science and looking at the intersections. So we have some amazing conversations. And what are some of the topics that you um, cover what can you give us a preview I was talking to Heather Spence Dr. Heather Spence who is a um, marine scientist but she's also a musician and creates marine music and she's very cool I cannot wait for people to hear this episode but I learned that although Spongebob Squarepants was one of my favorite shows growing up that dolphin sound that we hear on SpongeBob SquarePants, like when SpongeBob is cursing, they play a a dolphin sound to cover up like the curse Mm -hmm. words. That sound is not actually a dolphin. Oh no. It's a bird. What? 
Yes. We've been lied to our whole lives. We've been lied to our whole lives. It's a bird. And they use that same dolphin sound in a lot of different shows to... No way. Yes. They they use it in a lot of shows to be like, oh, this is dolphin. Like, ee, it's a bird. It's like a bird. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then we talked about, like, Finding Nemo. So when, in the beginning of Finding Nemo, there's this, you know, fatal incident where the mom is injured and, and she is she passes away and the dad is left to raise Nemo, the baby. Now, the hugest <laughs> misrepresentation in the movie is that when the mom passed, the dad actually should have transformed into a female clownfish because that's what happens in nature. So instead of, it should have been instead of Nemo, you know, Nemo's dad in his male form going to look for Nemo. It should have been Nemo's dad in a female form looking for Nemo. But that wasn't, that science wasn't included. They had everything else in there, like the ocean currents and the turtles and all of the other things. But this huge, like, <laughs> life changing so event. It would have been cool to know the science behind that. I think, yes. you know, that's why we need scientists working in. The media. All industries, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To like help to help tell that story and not make it confusing because it's real and it's that's the science. It's pretty fascinating. The real stuff is pretty fascinating itself, right? Yeah. Wow. Well, I can't wait to listen and I will definitely check it out. I want to shift gears to just some advice to the students that are listening today. Um, I want to start just with you know, are there any common misperceptions about being a scientist? You talked about identity and, and being a scientist, but are there any other uh, misperceptions that you often hear as a scientist? That we don't do fun stuff. Yeah, like, I don't know. I'll I'll be out doing doing my thing and having fun, doing the fun things that I like to do. And if I'm in, in the middle of doing those fun things and for whatever reason, the fact that I'm a scientist comes up. There's always an element of surprise. It's like, well, what did, why are you here having fun with us? Like, <laughs> Or how can like, you have, what? how can you be fun yourself? You're a exactly. scientist. And so I think that's a huge, huge misconception. Mm. Um, another misconception is that we know everything. And... You know, I, I get, I've gotten this comment a lot. Well, you're a scientist, you would know. And I'm like, actually, the whole point of being a scientist is that I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> and I do my best to figure it out. And I'm really good at figuring things out mm. because I understand the scientific method and I, I know how to do research. But if we knew everything, we wouldn't have jobs. Our whole sure. job is to not, to not know and to find out. Yeah. <laughs> You just said to be a scientist is to to uh, be really good at figuring it out. Can you fill in the blank? You know, if you are good at X, then you should be a scientist. If you're good at trying things over and over again, then you'll be a great scientist. You can't give up. So very few times are we actually right or we get it right the first time. And so you have to be up for the adventure, really, of figuring it out and what figuring it out looks like is a lot of failure. Mm. Um, it's a lot of failure, but it's also a lot of learning. And failure isn't, in my world, failure isn't bad. It's just a redirection. So be good at failing and fail forward is sort of exactly. What you're yeah. Yeah. That was molecular biologist Dr. Raven, the science maven. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Make sure to click the follow button on your podcast app so you never miss a new episode. We are at Most Likely To Show on YouTube and at Most Likely To Dot Show on Instagram and TikTok. Tag us in your posts about the show. This show is about exploring the journeys of the people you care about, so let us know who you're interested in hearing from by sending in your requests at podcast at donorschoose.org or DM us on Instagram 